Oh, are we doing it? We're doing it. Okay. <laughs> we made it again. Take two. Take two. <laughs> um, thanks for coming. And uh, we're being graced to have no rain just yeah. for the minute whilst we're recording this, which is good. Yeah. And there might be some uh, other sounds and noises and things, but we'll do our best. Mm. Yeah. So uh, tell me a little bit about you, which is where we started off last time. Um, there's a lot of interesting tidbits around your path and your journey. Uh, you were not born in Australia. No. How no. long have you been living here for? Uh, 33 years now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Came over, I thought, for three weeks. Three weeks turned into 33 years. Yeah. So wow. far. And a family and all that wonderful yeah. things that go with it. And mm -hmm. Australian citizenship. And yeah, it was a big life changing turn, a life turning point event in my, in, in my journey. Yeah. Um, I'm trained as a classical, classical musician, a symphony brass player. Mm -hmm. And have several degrees and such and taught universities and freelanced and did a lot of playing in America. Yeah. Um, but on that journey was also parallel with my, I guess you'd say your soul's path mm -hmm. that had been activated very early in my life. I grew up on a farm um, and had a kind of a healing crisis when I was six, seven years old. It was um, kind of a wake up call to uh, my own awareness of myself. I was just isolated for a very long time mm -hmm. as a child. Okay. And away from my family as well. Yeah. So um, yeah, that kind of set me on the path and journey and search. And I grew up in the 60s and went to university in the 60s and um, had all that wonderful stimulus and reality mm -hmm. events, uh, big things that would happen. Um, what was it like living in the 60s in America? Well, it's just, just so much of it. I mean, on the one hand, as a musician, it was all happening. Yeah. It was an explosion, both in uh, the conservatory kind of area that I was in, in music, but in popular music. It was just everywhere and things were happening and anything was possible. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, and as a musician, I got to play in a lot of different genres. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually focused upon, you know, classical music is where I really wanted to be. Um, you know, certain things that I had a gig playing Dixieland traditional jazz, right? Mm -hmm. In both Ann Arbor and in Detroit, where I was at university. And I gave that up because I couldn't stand the cigarettes more. Being in these small rooms with low ceilings, yeah. you know, trying to play tuba. I was playing tuba on one set and washboard on the other, and trading <laughs> off back and forth with my teacher at the university. And making good money, but you know, it was poisoning me. I could feel that very quickly. Yeah. And so I think I've been proactive in my life and making choice, make, making distinctions. Yeah. That then resulted in choices. And along that path, um, I was very, like everyone, ambitious and trying to do things, pretty much worked myself into a healing crisis, another healing crisis. And um, do you mind if I just sort of pull out for a second there this word healing crisis because yeah. you mentioned it twice now so what is a healing crisis and what was it for you on those two occasions okay that's that's right thank you for doing that as i understand this comes out of uh, the transpersonal psychology of the late 90s and early 20th century uh it's part of recognized in the shamanic traditions as well that there an event happens that takes the initiative into a non-ordinary space mm -hmm. and usually that is manifested by some sort of physical manifestations and problems mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and so with me at one day uh, working three jobs and being a freelance musician and a young father with a young son and um all one day i just couldn't walk okay my feet just wouldn't carry me so i got crutches and continued on right <laughs> but um Doctors weren't really much help with it until I came across a physician who said, hey, I'm just starting up a men's group this week. Why don't yeah. you come and join them? Yeah. And that's how I got introduced to men's work and to a whole process of healing that went on with uh, later attending to a vision quest that kind of walloped me with big time kind of 
uh, experience that was integrated into my music as well that led to a student one day at the university handing me a didgeridoo. He said, I think you'd be interested in this. <laughs> and I was for various reasons, um, many various reasons. Anyhow, so I came to Australia, I thought for three weeks, to get a didgeridoo and go home. Mm -hmm. And that was because, well, Americans never take holidays. Americans never go overseas. As a freelance musician, you got to be there answering your phone, all right? And back in those days, it was a landline. Yeah. So <laughs> getting the calls if you're not answering them. Well, even you're telling people, hey, I'm going away for three weeks. It's like, oh, yeah, okay. Well, I'll put him second down on the list. I won't call him first next time. Yeah. This guy's moving on or something. Mm -hmm. It's a very fluid kind of thing in, mm -hmm. in the portfolio career of a musician. So I came over to find a didgeridoo and ended up getting taken on this rather magical adventure that used up my three months visa and being taken into Arnhem Land and given a didgeridoo. And with that profound experience of being taken in and seeing the actual lives of Aboriginal people in Australia, being in the communities and the beauty and the horror of it at the same time, I went back and I didn't feel like I quite fit anymore in Boulder in Colorado where okay. I was living. It was like, this is, things are out of, out of disjunct now in my perception of things. And I had brought back this amazing didgeridoo that I was given. Mm -hmm. And everyone kind of looked at that and went, well, what are you going to do with that now? <laughs> Did you know about didgeridoos before the first one was given to you in the US? Well, that's a good question. It's a funny question. Um, in music training in our undergraduate, we have in our music theory training, there's a thing called drop the needle, yeah. where they play excerpts or something, or you be played the sound of an instrument and told its name, and you maybe see a picture. And so my association with didgeridoo from that teaching process was, it was a string instrument because of the sound of it. Wow. I thought it was a string drum. Wow. And I knew it, I mean, I knew it was a wind instrument, but it, it, the information, you know how it is. It doesn't quite go together. It's too abstract. Yeah, like a low double bass string bowed or something. Yes, yes. Um, not to get distracted on that, but um, <laughs> um, and so when it was handed to me, well, actually, it wasn't handed to me. There was this graduate student who I kind of knew. He was a flute player, and he came to my door, interrupted the music lesson. I was so I was kind of annoyed about it. I only had an hour with this student, and. He said, I think I've got something you'd be interested in. I said, what is it? And he pulled it out of this case and it was this painted didgeridoo. He said, it's a didgeridoo. And I, I grabbed it. I took it off of him. Mm. I violated, I made it as a taboo with instrumentalists. It's like, wow, nice sex, mate. Oh, hey, can I have a little blow? Maybe yes, maybe no, but you ask, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't ask him anything. I just grabbed that thing and played it. And as soon as I heard the sound of it, I recognized it as a sound that was analogous to the sound I had heard in a recurrent lucid dream as a child. Wow. That I'd never forgotten, but could never quite. It was a, a sound associated with the landscape. I was like, whoa, <laughs> hello. Um, and so this instrument was lent to me mm -hmm. for a period of time. And I started doing little things in concerts with it and stuff with my brass quintet and playing <laughs> didgeridoo and then started working with a storyteller because I had learned that didgeridoo and the song man went together and the things were, you know, there were layers of the same kind of artistic process. And so we experimented with that and did some recording with it as well. And became kind of this Australia file. Uh, most everything I learned at that time in America was in the slightly incorrect about Australia or majorly <laughs> incorrect. Um, but I was fascinated by the place and the thought of a didgeridoo. And friends started saying, well, if you don't go to Australia and get your own didgeridoo, we're going to stop talking to you. You just got to go. It was obvious enough to them. <laughs> it was more obvious to them than to me. I was in it. Yeah. You know, and I think yeah. that's part of what I, what I I take away with what I present now with men's work is that it's experiential and it's a yeah. process mm -hmm. and it's about really taking in the reality that's in front of you and, mm -hmm. and living it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, okay. So I come over for three weeks, uh, end up meeting with people 
uh, at the first Whalen Dolphin Conference, who I just happened to get invited to because a friend's father was the keynote speaker. And he heard I was coming to Australia. He said, oh, come with me. Come to the Whalen Dolphin Conference. And met all these wild, wonderful people. Got taken to the 1988 um, bicentennial uh, thing at Brisbane, the whatever they called it, I can't remember. First act I saw in there was Circus Oz. Oh my God, Circus with Frank Zappa and they're playing the music. I was like, well, I'm in heaven. <laughs> These people are doing things the way I like it. And, and got met people and talking about different things and I got taken to Iron Man and thrown into Iron Man looking for a didgeridoo. And so this was no holiday to Australia. This was a calling really. I don't know what we should label it as. And I'm, I'm, the older I get, the less interested I am in labels. Sure. It was my process. It was my process that I was willing to continue to show up for. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, I went back to America as I was expected to, took up my teaching at the University of Colorado and the University of Wyoming, doing both at the same time, my old habits, prime playing my quintet and orchestras. And I just didn't feel like I quite was there or fully there. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to go back again. I'm going to go back and prove that the first trip was just a joke. Mm -hmm. Beginner's luck. <laughs> it doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> and of course, I was proved wrong. I went back and dropped right into two corroborees that were happening at that time. And just lots of deep connection with the elders there of with the simple, very simple message, which was just, it's about relationships, stupid. Mm -hmm. We're all related. Mm -hmm. It's all related. Mm -hmm. And we're here to create the art and to sing it and to praise it and to, that's wow, as a performer, I can understand that. Yeah. So, Is that another way of saying we're all one? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, we, even when we say we're one, we're making a distinction and that distinction is as false as the distinctions you make every day mm -hmm. in trying to label things and control them. Yeah. Yeah. So that was quite profound. And so um, I just didn't go back. Mm -hmm. I made that phone call and said, I won't be back. This is where I am now. <laughs> well, I didn't know. Yeah. I just know it was, it was so provocative mm -hmm. and interesting and metaphysical, um, all things that I had developed in my life already. I mean, um, when I was in Rochester teaching and uh, studying, I was at the Zen Center there. Mm -hmm. And Philip Kapler was the Roshi there. And he had the book called The Three Pillars of Zen. And yeah, studied Zen. I was involved with uh, the whole Naropa art scene in Boulder with Choyam Trumpa Rinpoche. I never became a member or a real joiner of these things mm -hmm. where I never took vows with any of these because again, they didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. I, I just, and because I loved it so much, it scared the hell out of me. And the first time I really dropped into the Zazen session, mm -hmm. it scared me. Mm -hmm. Just the immensity and the depth of the possibility. But in order to be in that, I felt like he had to become quasi Japanese, and that didn't feel authentic to me. Yeah. As, as beautiful as it all is, yeah. As much as I could enjoy that, mm -hmm. is like, and the same thing with the Tibetan tradition and the amazing art and music and mm -hmm. ritual and all. It's really juicy. But I was happy to be on on the sides of it and contribute in my way. Um, my brass group used to play for their big festivals and stuff in the mountains where they were doing ceremonies to the horns and things. So we we're happy to do that. But um, the life then, I mean, this is in the Reagan's 80s uh, when I'm there. And um, it was hard musically. A lot of orchestras were on the verge of bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. um, musicians weren't happy. Um, and in some ways, I was looking at it another 20, 30 years of doing the same thing mm -hmm. there. But suddenly mm -hmm. I have this other thing over here in Australia, as st strange and as exotic as it was, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I can't ignore that. Yeah. So I gave this up. Yeah. 
And then later in life, as you know, I came back around to it where I'm back in classical music again. I came around <laughs> in full circle. Yeah. But I had, I had this journey through Arnhem Land and Central Australia and in doing work with people. Um, mm. So you perform now, though. Like, oh, yeah. When's the, when's the last time you played like this week? Last Saturday. Yeah. 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 And what was that? I was concert with the Queensland Wind Orchestra. Yeah. Um, it was a concert that um, was our, going to be our first concert back post COVID where the audience could come freely and didn't have to wear a mask and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. And we had that online conscious and all kinds of stuff during COVID, but it was gonna, it was a real celebration. Mm -hmm. um, but then we had the floods here yeah. and that kept me from going, getting to rehearsals because I traveled 300 kilometers round the trip to go to a rehearsal with this group because mm -hmm. they're the best thing in Australia, maybe the Southern hemisphere, mm -hmm. in this kind of wind ensemble performance. And we're doing two world premieres in this concert and other new music. And I was able to get there for the concert and learned that uh, 10 other players had called in sick that day having COVID. Mm -hmm. And they had found 10 players to substitute for them on five, six hours notice. Wow. Here's the music. Good luck. <laughs> no, not good luck. See you at the concert. <laughs> get it right. <laughs> and we did. Yeah. We did, and that's that's the thing that is so exciting to me about large ensemble music that I play now is it's this gestalt experience mm -hmm. with fifty other people mm -hmm. of being precisely in the moment, mm -hmm. focused and attentive to everything that's going on around you, mm -hmm. and dancing with that, playing mm -hmm. with that. Um, we play we played out of our minds. It was an amazing concert. Wow. Yeah. So there's something about like the energy of that um, unexpected situation that actually amplified. It's a catalyst. Yeah. Just like the floods here have been a catalyst for this community. Yeah, sure. To come together. Mm -hmm. That's really positive in that way. Yeah. Though it comes through strife. Yeah. You know? uh, back to uh, what's the guy's name again? Kingsley. Peter um, Kingsley. Peter Kingsley. Yes. 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 Love and strife. <laughs> Yeah, strife and contention and the rubbing up against each, each other. Um, so this is the same with the healing crisis in a way, though. So yes. where there's that big strife that, that comes up and then all of a sudden the new you is born out of the strife itself because you are forced to let go of what you were holding on to that you thought you knew. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it has that potential. Yeah. There is no, there no guarantee. Is no guarantee. <laughs> you will earn it. Mm -hmm. but you will earn it by not trying to become controlled by the situation mm -hmm. or try to become controlling of it but of reading it and then going with the good energy yeah all right what feels right here and those are very small kinds of adjustments that are only possible if you've actually done the inner work of attending to whatever meditation works for you mm. to learn about yourself and what we call in, in our men's work, our inner counsel. Yeah. Who are all these characters inside here who show up here or there or somewhere else and which ones have good ideas for you and which ones don't. And then to discover that small little inner voice that doesn't have a should. Yeah. And that's the one I really try and look for and listen mm. to. Like, okay. So you have to be paying attention yeah, to, like as the core to be able to work in that way and be aware of all that. Jack Cornfield says this thing about the sign in Vegas. It says you have to be present to win. Yes. <laughs> so it's like you don't get the opportunity to to handle that nuance between uh, not controlling and not being controlled by unless you're fully present. Yes, and I've always thought, yeah, well, I, there's the yin yang. You know, everybody talks about the papas and the negative the light, the dark. Right? Yeah. And then, okay, that's all cool. But what's really important is that little snaky line. <laughs> right? That's where the action is. Mm. Right? There's an old Zen saying, uh, ride your horse along the edge of the sword mm. and hide in the midst of the flames. Which I think just perfectly encapsulates the the experience of the journey and staying on that line, that beam of, yep, 
that's just how it's feeling. I'm going to dance with that, mm -hmm. make it happen. Well, for most people, I mean, they're, they've had to follow their own dreaming and maybe locked into what they feel as responsibilities, with jobs and works and stuff mm -hmm. that it's all workable with that, but you, we end up feeling controlled and like we have to push, push back against it yeah. and keep pushing all the time mm -hmm. and going faster and faster. Mm -hmm. And paradoxically, it's like it go slower to get there faster, mm -hmm. make less mistakes. Yeah. That's certainly why I teach in the music. Like, play that passage slowly. Make sure you got every note. If you play it fast and make a mistake, you'll make it again. And you're, yeah. you're just practicing the mistake. Mm. Go slow. Take so in our men's circle, you reference this quite often. Uh, go slowly, slow down, slow it down in your mind, slow it down in the way you're moving. Mm -hmm. And I also, in my looking into masculinity, conscious masculinity, this is a big part of that archetypical masculine energy is to not be rushing around, to be sort of even about your pace. Mm, I think it's in Lao Tzu, I Ching, uh, the, the sage never rushes. Yeah. And stays in their own time. Mm -hmm. But even if they're moving quickly, they're not rushing. Yeah, that's really <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> well, that's all the Kung Fu kind of movies. Yeah, stuff, yeah. You know? They're going very quickly, but then you see them, you know. <laughs> because that's the feeling of it. Yeah. That's the experience of it that... Yeah wants to be cultivated and it's like any garden it's like yeah. we can see our inner life as a council of, of characters or we can see it as a garden or we can see it as a vegetable soup yeah <laughs> or whatever metaphor you want to use but whatever is you're cultivating and you're cooking mm. with these ingredients mm. and getting to know them better as time goes on hopefully well that pace that you're recommending or at least the perception of that pace, whether you're doing moving fast or slow, you've got you've got like a grounded, even mindedness about your awareness, maybe about where where your energy is coming from, and so that like you you get more information from that pace as well because if you're rushing through, you miss things. It's richer. So so you might in some ways get somewhere slower, but with so much more wealth of experience and information along the way yes and, and that's why i always say richer because it's our habit to think of it as things yeah i'm getting these things called information sure. they're not things at all yeah they're processes mm -hmm. it's all a process we're in an amazing weather process now yeah. a condition where it can just dump rain anytime it feels like mm -hmm. and then stop yeah and go again um, which is information for us yeah. about how we need to live here in the future. I mean, we've been given such a profound gift here in this crisis that is stressing and really challenging everyone. Yeah. And so that's initiation. Yeah. That's what's known as initiation. And yeah. I have been through initiations and I have taken people through initiations. Yeah. And it's not about provoking crisis, but allowing the opening, yeah. the crack, there's an old book called Crack in the Cosmic Egg. Um, it was very early, actually, Jesus on this. Uh, what's his name? Johnson? Can't remember right now. But um, this, is, this is information we've known for tens of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. The obstacle is the path. Is that the same? Well, <laughs> what is it? The Captain Jack Sparrow? Uh, the problem's not the problem. <laughs> The problem's how you look at the problem. <laughs> From Zen Cohen's to Captain Jack Sparrow. Right, right. <laughs> wow, hey, they're all weird. Yeah. Okay, and the weird way meant that you were walking in both worlds. Crazy wisdom. Yeah, that's Triumph Trump Club for sure. Crazy mm. wisdom, guru. Mm. Um, and play. Yeah. All of these things involve play. And you know with Captain Jack, he's very playful. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's taking the <laughs> Nicky out of everything all the time. Because if you take this seriously, which people think they have to, mm. I'm going to go do a workshop. Or I'm going to go do, uh -huh. oh, this is a really serious business. And I'm going to, uh -huh. that's just tightness. Yeah. You know, and it's not being available. Mm. And while this all sounds very really fine and hunky-dory, there just is no guarantees. Yeah. You will earn it. And um, you can't predict how it's actually going to play. And the way it does play out 
I'm fine. It's better than I could have imagined. Mm -hmm. And when I finally realized that, while well, back, I said, oh, okay, well, I can have my ideas about it. Mm -hmm. but now I'm really going to watch how it takes on a life of its own. Yeah. So like when I came back into music, it was kind of a whimsical thing. Mm -hmm. But then once it took on, I was like, oh, okay, well, this has energy. This is mm -hmm. actually wants to move. It's like, well, let's see where it can go. And it's gone to much better places than I could have imagined. Yeah. Well, even our conversation right now was going to happen one way. It was overcome by sound, which is funny in itself because of your focus on sound and yeah. uh, actually white noise, white. rain. <laughs> <laughs> and then here we are, and for you know, I'm not really marking or comparing or analyzing, but maybe this is the the result that needed to happen, and not the conversation we had the other day. Obviously, yeah, because this is what is is. Mm -hmm. you know, we're back to Empedocles again and yeah. Parmenides and all those wonderful pre-Socratic philosophers who held the tradition for us out of the shamanic tradition of the yeah. Mongolian culture to be present and to involve yourself with stillness. Yeah. That's how they describe it. Mm -hmm. And so, like with our men's work, that's how that's how we roll and, and, and how we we do our thing. I mean, we always start with being on the ground if possible, having a fire, but mm -hmm. drumming. Mm -hmm. Sound again with the we, drumming. And we don't, yeah, we don't start by, hi, how are you going, mate? What's happening? Oh, what would you do this way? None of that chit chat. It's like, whoo, yeah. 20, 30 minutes of just the drum. Which is profound. As to release. Least, to show up and, and be received in that way to start off with. It brings me my personal experience is that I come to a different space at the start than I've been experiencing all fortnight of like, Oh, okay. That's how it's almost like it shows you how far off the mark you were <laughs> in a way. Well, and this heartbeat call. And I always kind of, when people are coming in a little late and stuff, I'm always happy for them mm. because I know I've had the experience in different ceremonies and stuff in North America back in the day. Uh, to be approaching the, the ceremonial ground and hearing the drum. Mm -hmm. And just what a... Uh, <sighs> yeah. Calling them in. Well, and, and, and so it's this magnetic thing. Yeah. It's not telling you what to do. Mm. It's not telling you what to think. Mm. But it's striking that empathetic chord, mm -hmm. and that relational thing that we then come together and we, we are able to connect heartfully mm -hmm. without using these things to impress each other yeah and then we can have our council which mm. we were talking last time as i recall we were already talking about how it's important that our council is confidential yeah because we're the only ones who have the context mm -hmm. and in being confidential it allows a space for people to relax and not have to present their hero mm. we certainly appreciate the hero we want to hear your hero stories mm. and you know, expect those heroes stories, but we also want to know how how it's feeling for that little boy who's still with you and that wounded one and mm. the rest of them in our relationship I mean, relationships are a big part of what needs to be witnessed it's kind of like a halftime hustle it's like the game's paused for a minute you don't have to out be here. here you were out in the field and oh, the, yeah. you know and then you come in and you you know kind of take stock and re-energize and let go of whatever was bothering you on the field. Catch your breath. But it's like another world from the fields. The same rules don't apply. Like you're not against anyone. You're not competing. You're just sitting there regathering your... Well, yes. Like from one point of view, yes, that's true. But that's not what we aspire to with our circle. And that we want to find our center, find our healing. Mm -hmm to become stronger and more confident in mm -hmm. our authenticity. Mm -hmm. That's the best gift we could give back out in the consensus world mm -hmm. is to re-enter refreshed in our authenticity and then be good examples of, we don't have to deal with this always in conflict. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, hey, we're, we're approaching an election. An election of what? Of politicians. Mm -hmm. People who only want to deal in politics, which is only about strife and competition. When what we really desire is good governance. Mm. I don't want their politics. Yeah. I want them just to do their job and govern this place properly. Mm. And that's all the people of the world really want anywhere. It's just yeah. 
hey, what's our value? Is it supersonic missiles and submarines <laughs> or the health and well being mm. of all the life on this continent, which is extremely unique? Yeah. It's the only example we have of this thing. And right. good old fashioned wholesome leadership as well, which just seems like totally vacant when you look. Well, you can't have leadership when it's, it's, it's all about projection, yeah. psychological projection and power. Yeah. And power is addictive and the power is, uh, makes people sick. I mean, mm. I look at most, most of the policies, and you know, these people are just sick. Yeah. So in the context of this men's circle business, like, so this, that political world is a reflection of where there's been a lack of healing as a whole. So what part does, say, a small group of guys like we do meeting fortnightly, how does that impact and relate to what's happening on a bigger scale? Well, a bigger scale can take care of itself. We have no control over that. We yeah. are getting lessons with COVID and with our floods and stuff that, you know, you're a little thing. But our presence, mm -hmm. as we live our lives with our families, mm -hmm. our careers or work or whatever we want to call that activity that is productive in the world of money, mm -hmm. how, we, how we deal with money, how we approach uh, our negotiations with people. If we're coming from that place where we can touch into our authenticity rather deeply, regularly, then we have the ability to bring that with us in those accounts and choose a different way of doing the dance in the moment. Yeah. That has an effect. So that, that is, changes things. And it'll be changed in little ways. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking like, you can go and you can vote, but you have more of an impact on the world by being present and being authentic, like what you're saying. Like there's actually more access to powerful change through yeah. dealing with right here. And yes, you can go and vote or you can say your political views, but it's more, um, more effective to impact people, the people that are around you through being present and authentic. Yes, and taking the values that you really appreciate that you would want for yourself. Yeah. So in my discourse with people, I, I, I want respect mm -hmm. and I want clarity. Mm -hmm. I don't want cliches. Mm -hmm. And so I don't give cliches mm -hmm. and I try and be clear, but I also try and be generous and kind in how I'm communicating mm -hmm. about things that are very contentious normally, mm -hmm. which is the opposite of people going, oh, did you hear what happened then? Or yeah. this or that. And yeah, you, yeah. you go for the, the, the ugly fear part of it. Well, all you're doing now is strengthening that. Yeah. Whatever you oppose, you make stronger. Mm -hmm. This is why back in the 60s when I was a student, the student demonstrations and other demonstrations were happening all around me. Mm -hmm. And I heard the helicopters overhead and smoked the tear gas and all that. But I wasn't, I wasn't going to participate in them because from where I was, like, well, you're just, your resistance is making this worse. Right? Or when the Detroit riots happened and we had people coming into the university from Detroit uh, after Martin Luther King was killed. I mean, they tore the place apart. It didn't help at all, it made things worse. Yeah. It made their own lives worse. So in finding authenticity and uh, a genuine spirit of, of life and liveliness, and hey, I like it here. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wanna promote the life here. If we can, we can find that way when we're talking to people, to be more humorous, mm. be Captain Jack again, mm -hmm. right? And say that quirky little thing that makes me, oh, what? What'd you say? <laughs> um, and then you can start to have interesting conversations. Mm. It's not attacking the problem directly, because mm. isn't that what we're taught? Mm. We're supposed to attack every problem immediately. And, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. The enemy and the hero. Yeah. yeah. So it's subtle. Yeah, you know, and there is no push button answer to this, this stuff. It's yeah. about living it and dreaming it mm -hmm. and making it juicier and, hap and happier because that's what you want. Mm -hmm. And then the whole boat, everyone rises on that. Mm -hmm. And we can see it in our communities, but there's a big world there and it's been traumatized. It's been traumatized for a long time. Yeah, and yeah. Increasingly in the last five years. And things must, we've just been told this week, things must change. Mm -hmm. Not just some things. Everything, everything yeah. has to change. Yeah. So that's How like, are we going to do that? So that's the macro healing crisis. 
that's that's the imbalance all of a sudden our pace and direction has created some kind of collapse and there needs to be a way that's different totally different like a new identity yeah it's not just some kind of clay it's the obvious collapse yeah we've overshot yeah in a big way Mm -hmm. and we knew it i've i've known i've had this information all my life Mm -hmm. one form or another growing Mm -hmm. growing growing Mm -hmm. growing um, all my adult life, and it's one of my griefs that my own generation has both succeeded amazingly. Like we produce some really amazing people, mm-hmm. but they don't have power. Mm-hmm. And the ones who went for power, the same old, same old. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's even more dangerous than it was before. Mm-hmm. And that feels like a failure, not failure, but. It's easy to make it feel a failure, easy to feel a victim. Don't want to go there. But I, I will go to grief. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I find these days, uh, I have a lot of grief that I'm moving through myself, mm-hmm. physically, emotionally, yeah. around what's happened to people here, but more so what's going on out in the world with mm-hmm. the Ukraine and the rest of it. It's um, someone has to grieve. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the jobs we do in music, you know, we have elegies and requiems and we do that business. Grief's a really powerful and uh, I find fascinating emotion uh, in terms of like, it has like an unpredictable trajectory and it uh, can contain and involve all of the other emotions mm. that are related to it. Mm. And it's the type of thing where, you know, you can't, you can't ignore it. You can't shelve it like it kind of it has to happen at some point and if it you're, doesn't you're in the rapids it's very <laughs> viscerally like visually like in every way you can see it impacting you if you don't stop and go okay i got i gotta actually tend to this which is mostly just to turn and look at it yeah exactly yeah and be with it and then it's not as scary mm-hmm. as you are looking at it. and that's that piece but then it has this antidote as well that's occurring every day, which I think is another very interesting but unspoken about emotion, which is contentment. Mm. To have that ability to, oh, wow, actually, pretty nice right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we're having this great conversation. Yeah. I'm looking at this beautiful, amazing Pacific Ocean. Mm. Um, life's really good. Yeah. Oh, thanks for reminding me of that. (laughs) And who's doing the reminding? There's this total regression Mm -hmm. of observer who's being observed and Mm -hmm. being observed. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a hurricane going on here. Mm. I remember speaking about this when we first met. Oh, yeah. Yeah, something about like looking back, who am I? And then the layers upon layers of, Mm -hmm. I guess, structures or positions or concepts. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there an end to that? Why should it be? Mm. The circle doesn't end. Mm-hmm. The circle's eternal. Mm-hmm. And we're in a cycle. We're in a cycle of seasons and astronomical things, whatever, weather systems. It's all cyclical. It's all cyclical. Yeah. The Taoists really had it down, you know, 2,500 mm-hmm. years ago. They mm-hmm. codified it pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um, but then other people have as, as in succession generations. This is not in new information. Yeah, but it has been taboo information uh, for some time, mm-hmm. and those are for historical and political reasons mm-hmm. um, that maybe we don't need. We could get into in a small way, but you know, when when people came to the new world, mm-hmm. there was this thing that happened. I just was reading an academic article about this. the The Jesuits showed up in Canada, and they ended up meeting with very high level Native American leaders. And we know in all of the top of North America, New York, Pennsylvania, up into New England, there was the Iroquois Confederation, five tribes that actually had a constitution that was the inspiration for the American constitution because people like Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson interacted with those people during the French and Indian Wars and other times to learn that, wow, they had a representative democratic Wow. Right? Anyhow, you know, there was this dialogue between the French Jesuits on their worldview and the view of the Native Americans. And 
boy, the Native American guys saw right through them. I said, you guys are pain and strife. They don't want to know about you. You know, we got a problem here. You know, everything's, everything's going to be fought over. Um, those ideas were taken back. And some people say it actually sparked some of the, uh, of the enlightenment, mm -hmm. both positively and negatively. Mm -hmm. The people saying, oh, we can't go there. We have to actually control things and make it more thin. <laughs> and they say, well, no, these guys got something to do. To this. Yeah, it's like the French Revolution happened partly out of this business, right? Mm -hmm. And it was felt like that was going to be a contagion in Europe. Mm -hmm. So instead, we had no Napoleonic Wars. Mm -hmm. that, was, that solves it. So it became taboo. It remained taboo. It remains taboo. Yeah, it remained taboo out of the whole prohibitions that came first from the medieval Catholic Church and then through the Protestant Reformation yeah. and all the destruction that was done mm -hmm. during that time and the repression mm -hmm. and the, the idea that you could translate the Bible literally yeah. rather than metaphorically. And now with the internet and, uh, and sort of, you know, so we have the, this renaissance of thinking in this way, exploring these things. But you also have, like, w with the same amount of intensity, maybe even more, I don't know, but this this uh, growth movement in the materialistic mm -hmm. perception, mm -hmm. kind of, they, they're growing, mm -hmm. expanding together. Mm -hmm. Because the energy won't be denied. Yeah. I have a personal opinion that some time ago, not too long ago, 20 odd years ago, in some way, everyone made their choice as which way they were going right. to pursue. And out of that has grown these contending points of view now. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of that, snaking through it is reality. Mm -hmm. That's that little yin yang thing again. Mm -hmm. And reality cannot be denied. Mm -hmm. When we had a 36 hour rain event, and then the consequences of that, suddenly we were dumped into reality mm. at a place that had all kinds of competing good notions about save this or save that and keep the koalas going or don't do gas fuel mm. whatever it was split in that suddenly just went and came right together on oh we've got reality to deal with now and the most beautiful things have happened as a result still happening to this day so when strife comes we can take it as an opportunity to have closer contact with reality. Yes, and it's 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 in our history, it's in our literature. This this is Homer. This is the Odyssey, right? The Uber Mentis Odysseus, Odysseus, you know, navigating his way through one one <laughs> crisis after another, yeah. and they can be crises of monsters, yeah, and natural phenomena, temptation. And women and temptation <laughs> and yeah, now he could have stopped along the way several times. Yeah, and never continue <laughs> on to reunite, to remember his relationship mm -hmm. with his land and his mm -hmm. family. And but when he came back, it wasn't just waiting laid form laid out, was it? Mm -hmm. No, he had come in disguise. Mm -hmm. He had remained that trickster. Mentis guy, you know, mm -hmm. who was navigating his way through all these obstacles to then succeed. Mm -hmm. And even within that, the one of the most brilliant parts of the Odyssey that I love is before he's identified, or actually Penelope tests him mm -hmm. after the suitors are killed and says, well, who are you really? And uh, she said, you, you've done this great deed. I'm gonna have our, our marriage bed moved out into the hallway so you can sleep there while I think about whether I'm gonna take you in or not. Right, which was a trick question because Odysseus had built their room and had built their bed around a live tree as one of the corner posts. And so it couldn't be moved, <laughs> right? But only Odysseus would know that, mm. right? And so there's this trick question at the very end, even after he's defeated the suitors and killed them and united with his son and doing that and that partnership of father and son, there's mm. a great story there in the Odyssey. That and reuniting with the feminine is like, you know, we're not joking around here, God. You know, yeah. Who are you? Who are you really? Yeah. I'm God. I'm the guy who made that bet. You can't move it. Mm -hmm. you know, okay, thanks. That's all I need to hear. <laughs> because time changes people. And yeah. 
Are you the same person you were when you left 20 years ago to fight this war and get lost? <laughs> oh, I just got lost on the way home, darling. <laughs> so that's like the feminine's call to the masculine to embody their conscious, authentic self, their and true truth. self. So it's like, that's cool. You just like were the hero of the whole world and yeah. conquered this. And that's like, you know, lighty da, well done. <laughs> you know, are you present and authentic right now? Because otherwise I'm not impressed. <laughs> Well, it doesn't go all the way, which is another concept we can talk about out of Peter Kingsley's work with the pre-Socratics, that tumos is the idea of being able to go all the way across the stream mm. and not get stuck halfway across the, right. the stream and go, oh, God, where's the next rock? I'm not going to do that. Yeah. But you, boom, 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 and you go through. Yeah. Now, are you going to get to go all the way through with this job? Mm -hmm. which I guess is the story of life. I mean, we're born, we take a breath and we go through this journey mm -hmm. and eventually then we let go of our breath. Mm -hmm. And have you come all the way through the potential of that, not by what somebody else told you to do mm -hmm. or somebody else said, oh, this is who you are, but by your own instincts and understanding, that's the ideal. Mm -hmm. And the hero's journey. Well, Joseph Campbell, uh, I mean, he had a big effect on all of us mm -hmm. back in the day. I mean, Joseph Campbell, Alan Watts, mm. people who are mine, right? Uh, other people were entertaining, you know? Mm -hmm. Terrence McKenna was very entertaining, mm -hmm. but really smart. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was just really smart. Mm -hmm. it's, so it was, um, what's his name? Timothy Leary. Timothy Leary. What an entertainer. <laughs> and Ramdas, yeah, his partner, and he Ramdas was, was the greatest comedian around in those days. <laughs> Very funny man about enlightenment and what a joke it was. Yeah, this is what his guru was talking. So yeah, we all take ourselves too seriously, but we also need, as men, some sort of place to come together and affirm <clears throat> our solidarity with the earth and with nature and with the process so that we have the confidence then to go out and make that live in the world as well. Mm. It's not either or, it has to be yes and. Mm. Before I started meeting and um, participating in men's circles and men's work, I would try and process things by myself or I would try and process things with say my girlfriend at the time. <laughs> And I might even try with a therapist. I, I like that you're laughing at that. <laughs> and there hasn't really been anything that's compared to going and sitting with men and just going, well, this is my, this is my mess today. <laughs> and then just being heard and held. So I guess I want to ask, you know, why is it important for men to meet with men to process in this way? Well, it's obviously a traditional thing to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, wherever we look in indigenous cultures around the world, we find the same things happening yeah. in successful societies. Mm -hmm. And certainly there's always men's clan groups based around totem identities and that sort of thing, whether it's Papua New Guinea or the Navajo country. Mm -hmm. All right. And that sustained them and help them move through in a much more gentle way upon the earth. Mm -hmm. um, our culture did a completely different thing and turned it on its head. Mm -hmm. And said, we got dominion over the earth. We're in charge of this place. We know better than nature itself. Um, we're gonna make this our way. Um, and so in fitting into that, we've all been taught to be phony. Mm -hmm. All right, take the test, pass the test, be the test. Impose your, impose your will, mm -hmm. you know, make this thing happen, get there faster, yeah. um, whatever. And so we've been indoctrinated into yeah. that attitude towards making our way in the world, which is very toxic mm -hmm. and then shows up in all kinds of health problems for men. Yeah. And we haven't talked about men's health mm -hmm. other than it's very healthy psychologically, obviously, and emotionally and with our personal agency but it's also for our bodies mm. right? yeah and so without you you're not as in, 
inclined to have to drown your sorrows in alcohol or mm -hmm. drugs or whatever. You can appreciate that if you want, but it's not a necessity in order to blot out the pain mm. of constantly being inauthentic. Yeah. This is my opinion. Yeah. An and observation. I, yeah. And as you're saying that, I'm just thinking about my experience through all that, all those years of, of meeting in men's circles, like the experience of my self-worth expanding, becoming just more grounded in like, yeah, like I'm okay. You know, like I'm, I'm worthy, I'm enough. And there's like, I am valuable. And it didn't quite come from anything else as much as it did from just sitting with men, hearing that they have the same types of problems and weaknesses as me, feeling accepted in my lowest with other men. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting about that is, because I ask over the years of running my own, there was a lot of men that I asked about it and some men would say, I'm not ready, I feel scared, I don't want to sit there and meet with men. But what's interesting is that part of a man in me was the thing that most um, grew and evolved and secured a sense of self-worth, mm. confidence, was actually going in and being vulnerable with other men. So the thing that they're resisting is the thing that they could benefit from. Well, yes, because you're vulnerable because you're safe. Yeah. It's a safe container, mm. right? It only happens for a period of time. It's now or never. You've got mm. a couple hours here that this is going to exist. Mm -hmm. It's a rare space. Yeah. It's a, it's a self-created sacred space mm -hmm. in, in, in the most genuine way. Mm -hmm. And so with that, uh, natural healing mm. occurs in its own good time, in its mm. own good way. People mm. go faster or slower. Mm -hmm. My experience, so I, I told you I had a doctor who actually prescribed to me, come to my men's group mm. when he saw me. <laughs> Take two of these and <laughs> like <them>. Well, <laughs> my reaction to it was like, you got to be kidding me. No way. I know about men. <laughs> men are cruel, <laughs> right? They'll put you down. Yeah. You know, if you show up and show yourself, they're going to put you down, whatever. Mm. That was my first reaction. And then I was able to step back from that and go, okay. That's a, that's a bias. You don't know. You haven't been there. Mm -hmm. And then some of the women in my life who said, how's it going? Did you see the doctor? I said, yeah, he wants me to join an men's group. Fantastic. <laughs> Celebrations. Go. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah, I think you really should. Mm. That kind of validation, which is, you know, mommy validation. And sure. It's not the, 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 but it's useful. Mm. right it mm. got me there yeah it got me there on my vision quest mm. i mean the only reason i joined this artist quest vision quest was because my yoga teacher was going on it and i yeah. wanted to be around her yeah <laughs> i didn't know it was a good thing for me it was but in that men's group um in a very interesting happening in about ooh, fourth or fifth meeting that i was at mm -hmm. in that my father who lived many states away in america Knew I was having a hard time. We weren't really close. Um, he was a World War II veteran, and I appreciate more and more every day how traumatized he was. Yeah, he spontaneously came out to visit me. Mm -hmm. He had never done this before. Mm -hmm. I was separated from my wife. We had gone off in a lesbian affair. I had my son. We're trying to raise him, and my dad shows up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, this is cool. Okay, he can get to know his grandson, and that's beautiful. I really like that. And then they rolled around from the men's circle. Mm -hmm. And um, Shannon was at school or something. He didn't even care. And I said, hey, Dad, look, I've got this thing this afternoon. Probably in this, I'm going to this men's group. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, really? What do you do? I said, well, we just kind of sit and share with each other and try and learn from each other how to uh, do this thing better. <laughs> I said, you wouldn't want to come, would you? I go, yeah, I would. Oh, wow. Yeah, big surprise. So I checked with the facilitators. Yeah, bring him on. So he came and we had our usual meeting, right? Mm -hmm. And he just sat and listened. He was in a circle and he was listening. He was introduced. And we got to about, we're going to break up in about 15 minutes, right? And everyone's going back to their big lives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And the facilitator says, so, Mr. Harvey, 
Um, it's really been nice having you here today. You've really been attentive to what's going on. Just wondering how this has been. And he started talking mm. about his life. But more importantly, for me, he talk, was talking for the first time I ever heard, maybe the only time if I think about it, about being in World War II, being in the jungle, mm. people being killed, friends being killed. He talked about this stuff and shared it with him and what it was like. And we were there for another two hours. Wow. No said a thing. And at the end, he was really hurt. And there was nothing really to say. And um, I feel quite emotional just re remembering the story in that. It was, mm -hmm. And that was a healing of the circle. Mm -hmm. And well, yesterday, you know, I sent a video. I went down to our meeting place <laughs> in the Grove that has been completely flooded. Mm -hmm. I mean, under meters of water <laughs> and everything cleaned out except for the rock circle of our sweat lodge fire and our council fire. Mm. didn't budge it a centimeter <laughs> it's there it's round it's mm. complete the water went around it wow it didn't have to push it away like the sticks and limbs and <laughs> the rest of the stuff and so the power of the circle what more can you say yeah if you can get into the circle in any way in your life you know, i feel that with my music when I play on my own, I feel when I play with other people, we're making a, a bigger container. Mm -hmm. And it needs attention, it needs work, it doesn't happen by itself. Mm -hmm. um, but you love it, it loves you. Mm -hmm. If you hate it, it'll hate you. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. that's, well, that's what Kingsley tells us out of his business, you know. Mm -hmm. What did you put out, we're going to get back. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, we have no right to exist as far as we know. Right. We don't know of any other examples of a life infected planet around a medium sized star. Mm -hmm. They're looking for them. Yeah. Well, fine. Well, I'm, I'm open to that. Who cares? We live. I don't care about, I want this place to throw. Yeah. You know? And this could be the Garden of Eden. We could transform this whole planet into the Garden of Eden in the next century. Yeah. We have the technology for it. Mm -hmm. We have the savvy for it. Mm -hmm. But we have to stop this contention and mm -hmm. strife being turned into warfare and fighting mm -hmm. rather than appreciating it as the grist for the mill mm -hmm. that makes the flower that then becomes the bread that then nourishes the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's maybe a good sentiment to end on. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Thanks, man. With everything that's, that's going on in the world. So... Thanks again for this second time. And, you know, I love our conversations, whether they are recorded or not. <laughs> um, and it'd be great. Uh, maybe we could do this again sometime. Whatever. Go yeah, in sure. some, other, some other direction. So thanks very much. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> thanks for tuning in to this month's episode of Presence, Healing and Purpose, conversations that inspire positive change in your life. If you found this interesting and enjoyable, feel free to subscribe, like, share it with your friends. And also, I just want to let you know that this is one of four offerings that I send out for free on a monthly basis in my newsletter, The Monthly Value. If you'd like to receive that, go ahead to the description and you'll see a little subscribe link to The Monthly Value. See you next time.